Sometimes this is referred to as the Friendship Treaty Belt. Other times it's referred to as the Silver Covenant Chain. So the idea behind it, it's a manifestation, if we can think of this this way, that anyone that settles within our territories, uh, anyone from any place in the world that chooses to live in this place, that their responsibility is to uphold the peace, friendship, and respect, and never to let go of that chain. And at the same time, for us as, uh, as Indigenous peoples, our responsibility is to help and to share and to teach and to provide uh, for uh, the well-being of all of life. And so we're tied together in our relationship. So when we look at this and we begin to uh, understand the emblematic depiction of our relationship as, as settlers and as Indigenous peoples, because now many Indigenous peoples have accepted this same idea and concept and use it in their speaking, uh, then we can also begin this process of looking at what does this mean in terms of our uh, sailing down the river of life together. So here's where we are today. The river of life is in trouble. It's in jeopardy now. All the things that we depend on for our sustenance on our life, our air, our land, our water, all the biological life that exists in the world, everything is in trouble. And now it's our responsibility to begin this process of working together. So when we talk about sharing knowledge and we talk about ethical space and we talk about relationships, it's already, already there. This becomes the ethical space between our way of seeing and our way of being. And so we can call that two-row science, we can call that two-row justice, two-row medicine, two-row processes, and we can add into those ideas and concepts, but it's already laid out those principles on how we should work together. And again, you know, be a, Understand that, you know, in this, un, in this way of life that because the river of life is in jeopardy, it now becomes our responsibility to care for that. Or, and again, there's no end to this, that it carries on until the very end of time. And that was one of the other things that people had talked about, and I'll end with this, is that, you know, in the early days, people thought, well, how long will this last? How long will these treaties last? And they talked about in this one in particular, they said, <clears throat> Uh, as long as the grass grows. They said, well, what about the winter time when it's covered over with snow? And they said, as long as the water flows. And they said, uh, oh, and then, well, you know, again, if in the winter time, if it freezes, they'll say, as long as the sun shines. And they said, well, what happens then, you know, at night? And then they talk about as long as the Mother Earth will continue to be in motion, that's as long as this, uh, this our relation, our sacred relationship will last between us. So, wow, our ancestors, they thought of everything. So here we are on day six. You know, in the biblical story, there were six days of creation and then a day of rest, which is a pretty powerful metaphor with the sacred geometry around the number seven. And I think what I want to invite for us to begin right now as I'm about to share with you a, a summary of the flow of all that happened in the last week, is to ask if we are about to enter a day of rest. I know that Brian and Susan are. I know that I am. We've been very busy. <clears throat> if we're going to enter a day of rest, and we're going to close our eyes and find the calm and the peace in ourselves, what shall be the stirrings of our dreams? What shall be the stirrings of our dreams on a day of rest as we prepare for what must come next? So what I want to do right now is walk us through the story of what has happened in the last six days to just show you again, because I, I mentioned this on Monday morning, that there's a logic to what we're doing. There's a, a model. There's a way of thinking of how the pieces fit together and I think we can see them now. So what I want to do is walk us through a synthesis of the week so that we can see this. Now, we could talk about it the way that I did on Monday, that every day of the week, there's a focus. Day one was change the story and looking at bioregional learning centers. How do we learn within place? How do we weave together all the ways of knowing within our landscapes? Day two, about empowering generations the vital and fundamental importance of our olders and our youngers coming together into harmonious mutual support. 
Day three, we talked about bioregional economies and collaborative funding ecosystems. And we explored case studies and real world examples of how this is already partially in place and that we need to just weave and connect the pieces further. We talked about finding a third way. What is that third way? That became clear to some of us Thursday afternoon and some of us early Friday morning as we were awakening from our dream space and taking in what had just happened to us. Yesterday was about connecting to land and listening to land and how do we deal with the need for unprecedented collaboration among people. All of this leading to the emergence and actually facilitating the emergence of the story of bioregional Earth. So, at the core of all of this was a way of understanding how bioregions can be organized how they can organize themselves. And so we offered this bioregional regeneration platform, which is that you create a learning ecosystem centered around bioregional learning centers that coordinate and bring together all of the ways of learning, all of the ways of knowing within the landscape that are connected to the living systems of that place. That we weave a tapestry of projects because everywhere you could go, anywhere on earth, if you go there today, you will find there are people who are restoring water, regrowing forest, healing cultural trauma, and so on. There's so much happening, but they're fragmented and they're isolated from each other and they need to be woven into tapestries and organized as landscapes. So these tapestries of projects are fundamental to the way we organize in the regeneration of bioregions. And then to do all of this, we need collaborative funding and governance. We need the movement of energy and resources and support, and we need decisions to be made close to where their consequences are with the best knowledge available for those decisions, which means we need bioregional governance and bioregional economies. And with this way of thinking throughout the week and the way that the days were structured, we applied this to the greater Takaranto bioregion. We asked ourselves, how far along are we at creating these things? Do the elements exist? And what are examples of them? And we'll see some of that as we go through this review. But then also, we recognize that no bioregion is an island, even the islands, because everything is connected by a living, <laughs> interdependent, dynamic Earth. And so we need to have a network of bioregions and exchanges between them. And we actually role modeled that this week by connecting with other landscapes. And so I want to show you how we did this. I want to show you how it played out throughout the week. <coughs> Taking this idea, you can see that there are all these pieces. This is a super simple diagram. There's a couple of words, a couple of little squares and circles. There's not much to it. But when you ask yourself, what does it take to make these things? you find you have to go out into the world and look at all the immense complexity of human relationships, institutional structures, historical patterns of development, current and future trajectories. And so these are actually incredibly complex things. So to see them, we have to see elements of them and then put them together, which is what we set out to do. One of the things I said on Monday and that I want to make really clear now is that we could not have had this summit as an unfolding and emerging story without decades of relationship work being done before. And on Monday, I named that the Legacy Project, the work that Brian and Susan have been doing, goes back decades. But then we have others like Deb Crandall, who spoke on Tuesday about the 35 years or however long it is of work in the Oak Ridges Moraine. There are people weaving in this landscape that have been doing it for a very long time. And the design school that Penny and I are co-founders of actually represents long histories of relationships. Some of those relationships we brought into this flow from outside of the bioregion. And as this weaving process took place before, it allowed us to continue weaving into these six days, including right now 
you're still part of the weaving that is still unfolding right now. And the idea is that we're going to move forward learning how to live into the tapestries of life as bioregions. And this is how the story of bioregional Earth actually will emerge. It's not a story written down in words. It's a story lived out in landscapes. And then you can only write about it after it makes sense from the experience of doing it. It's a very different way of living a story. And so this is what we've been doing throughout the week. So we started on Monday morning, gathering around the legacy table to talk about the importance of changing our stories. We had Sandra LaRond with us, Brian and Susan, Penny and I, talking about our stories of bringing the birth of this summit and what we hope to achieve and where we are with the state of the planet and how broken our stories are. And something that Sandra said that was really powerful was that we might actually want to ask what the original stories are in each landscape because most of us have no idea. It's like, well, what are the indigenous stories of this place? Most of us have no idea. So to recover those stories where they exist was a really a powerful theme. And that we need a story that can act in service to the continuation of life. Because if you've been paying attention, any time in the last 50 to 100 years, we're increasingly destroying life. We're destroying life with increasing efficacy, skill, and speed. A key theme was how to connect and dream into our life place how to feel our place as a living entity, how to feel our life as being connected and flowing through places, and how every life place is a story, or maybe many stories. And how do we live those stories into our life places? How do we change ourselves and our places as living stories? So in the afternoon, on Monday, we talked, actually in the late morning we started, talking about the regeneration of entire bioregions. How do we do it? And we presented that model I mentioned already. And then we talked about bioregional learning centers and how they're different from other models of education because mostly their work is to create an ecosystem of integration for what already exists. The coordination of existing learning processes, gateways into the community to navigate and find your way to where you need to be to be able to map and store knowledge and share knowledge and make it accessible to everyone in the bioregion. An idea articulated by Dana Meadows in 1983 as the only and best way to get to planetary sustainability because no better idea has been created since 1983. We regenerate the earth and we create healing and sustainability by setting up bioregional learning centers so that our bioregions, our holistic life places, can actually know and care for themselves as holistic systems. Bioregional learning centers are fundamental to this. Then we invited Brandon and Claire to come in from Cascadia. Regenerate Cascadia was born as a collaboration between Penny and myself at the design school and Brandon and Claire. And Brandon and Claire are the co-administrators. And they talked to us, what is a bioregion? How do we map them? What's happening in Cascadia? For those of you who don't know, Cascadia is the best known, most mature, and most advanced bioregional movement on Earth. I was born in another one. I was born in Missouri, or in bioregional language. I was born in the Ozarks. There are also people from Appalachia. There are other places that are known as the identity of their landscapes. I know people in the Carpathian Mountains who know themselves as a bioregional identity. But Cascadia has been organizing itself powerfully and coherently as a bioregion since the late 1960s. And so they shared with us what they're learning about their bioregion and how bioregional learning is similar and different to what's happening here in the greater Takaranto bioregion. And we began this exchange across scales how we could look at landscapes and landscape systems and relationships across the continent. We were already practicing that pattern of weaving by just having the conversation the way that we did. Then, Tuesday morning, we came to this room. Kieran and Deb got to meet each other. 
You might notice they're sitting there like best buds. <laughs> That's not an accident. You see the weaving of human beings and stories. See how they're already sitting together. I did not ask them to do that. Although I invited other people to sit with them because they're cool people. So what was happening on Tuesday was we were exploring how we have to bring the generations together. We have to bring them together. And so Kieran told his story. Deb told her story. Everyone was inspired. They were inspired by each other. And now they're friends. The weaving is happening. We moved into this exploration about how we can inspire and teach and learn from each other across cultures and landscapes and generations because this is the pathway. The pathway for learning is across generations, across cultures within landscapes. Kieran came and talked about his time growing up in Texas and his time in India, but he was here. Crossing cultures and generations and landscapes in this exchange. It was modeled in the structure of their exchange. It showed us how to do it. And it was a beautiful exchange. Then we called on my friend Oscar, who lives in Barichara, Colombia, where I live. And he had the bravery and the courage to practice his English in a big public event. And he spoke very well. And he told us the story of how the most violent place in Colombia became the island of peace and stability, and how they constructed their own peace as an intergenerational process. But now, because that violence amongst themselves also was violence against the land, that the landscape is turning into a desert, and soon there will not be any water, and everyone will have to leave. And so we talked about the regeneration of that landscape, some work that I'm involved in, some work that he's been doing since well before I arrived, because I arrived there in 2019. And then another collaborator of mine in Colombia, Natalia Ortiz, continued the story and shared more about the patterns of trauma and the need for us to come into healthier relationships and how this is express, expressed through the construction of peace the patterns of violence, and our relationship to land. So that those of us who have never been to a place like these places in Latin America that are very different from here, here you're in the most water-rich place on Earth, and there all of the rivers, 100% of the rivers, are dead. If they have water in them at all, they're so contaminated nothing can live in them. That's where Penny and I live. By the way, I went there to bring dead rivers back to life. I knew where I was going. And they talked about this. But then we learned that sometimes you get the best advice from a sixth grader. This young woman, Maya, showed all of us adults how to give a talk. Wasn't she awesome? Those of you who were here, she was amazing. And she interviewed Peter Whitehouse, who was coming in from Cleveland, Ohio, in the Cuyahoga River on the south shore of Lake Erie to talk about intergenerational schools. And by the way, Peter has been collaborating with Brian and Susan for a decade, bringing kids from intergenerational schools. Ethan, who's here, knows Peter. Young people, old people, learning exchanges across generations happening again. And this was happening so that we could experience again the role modeling of what the exchanges can look like. Young people can reach out to their elders and seek their advice, and elders can find inspiration, connection, and purpose by connecting with youth. And that we all need this. We all need this. And throughout the week, and you'll hear more about this in a few minutes, Patricia has been feeling the energy of the room and shaping the conversations into visual stories. And she's been documenting and archiving our journey, and she'll talk about this whenever I'm done, so you can get a feel for the stories that she's been capturing from the field of relationships and the field of exchanges throughout the week. You can see birthing new stories, life place, connecting community. She's going to talk about all of this. And then we went into the afternoon. Isabella Granick, who facilitated a beautiful process, 
using these things called glimmers, which I just love. We all know about triggers, right? Our psychological triggers are the things that shut us down. They're the things that cause us to have a trauma response and our bodies shut down. Glimmers are the things that bring us alive, that invoke awakeness, that create connection and openness to explore. Isabella. And look at what she got to happen. There's Victoria. Here's Victoria. Getting great advice from kids. <laughs> you can ask Victoria about it later over refreshments. But uh, these kids are smart. They have good ideas. These older folks are smart too, but that doesn't mean they know all the answers. Sometimes they need the kids to give them advice. They need fresh perspective. And so we explored in these intergenerational exchanges how we could grapple with the deep questions that were coming up for us in the summit. It was really beautiful. And then we got to Wednesday morning, where we were going to talk about how do we create these collaborative funding and governance ecosystems. We had Samantha Power with us, and she's working on creating frameworks to help people understand how to do this. She's interviewing a lot of people. She's doing a research study. And so she talked to us about what is she finding as she talks to people around the world, and gave us like a conceptual container for us to have a conversation. What does it mean to create a funding ecosystem organized as a landscape to regenerate that place? How does that work? Which was really beautiful because then we got to look at real life examples. And what's cool is that when Justine Daynard came in, this woman here on your left, when Justine came in and talked about circular economy in the county of Wellington, and the work they'd done to help about 300 local businesses and civil society actors in that county working with the city government and with the county government to mobilize for food security and food sovereignty and to create a stronger and more resilient local economy. It was like, what? That already exists? Yeah. They've been doing it for five years. And like, we're already creating many of the elements, not at the scale of the bioregion, but at the scale of major metropolitan areas within the bioregion. It's already happening. And then Vicki Saunders, this woman, all of you women, she should be your hero if you don't know her yet. She figured out how women could pull money together to create funds that then they could decide how to support each other as entrepreneurs to go out and make the world a better place. And they grew from a $500 fund to a $20 million fund. And they do wicked awesome stuff. And it's all based in interpersonal relationships, trust, and alignment with deep purpose in their hearts saying so much of this work is actually in ourselves and our relationships to each other. These are things that work, that exist, that are out in the world, that are ready to be organized around landscapes. And then we had Natalia come back, same Natalia that was there the day before, and she talked about how in Barichara, Colombia, we're actually prototyping a bioregional regeneration fund, and we're organizing collaborative gun governance at the landscape scale, we're about four years into this work, and she talked to us about how that is happening. But she spent most of her time talking about interpersonal conflicts and trauma. Because you know why we don't create these? Interpersonal conflicts and trauma. That's why we don't create these. So it turns out, you know, Natalia and I work really closely together, it turns out the way that we created a territorial foundation was by staying in a process as conflicts kept coming up. And some of us would leave and come back. And some of us would stay outside of the process, but come back through the community. And we'd all find our way back into relationship again, learning how to be in community. And that's how we're building it. And so these are like real world examples that say this isn't just a conceptual model. It's not just an intellectual exercise. We're doing it. We're doing it. And actually, just as a brief example of how the weaving happened, Justine was talking about this, and I made this rash comment like, the Toronto Foundation should fund this. And then someone from the Toronto Foundation wrote in the chat, I'm going to reach out to Justine. And just letting you know that the weaving was real. That's all I'm saying. The weaving is real. It was really happening in real time. And this moved us into the afternoon, where it's like, OK, we're talking about how to create these collaborative funding and governance systems. And there are people doing parts of it. And the GTB needs to create one. And this is part of what the summit's doing, part of the work that the Legacy Project is doing. But you know what we really need 
is to confuse ourselves a little bit, to stop thinking we know the answers and start asking better questions. <laughs> so Brian and Susan have the great idea of bringing Nora Bateson in to do a warm data lab. She messed with people's minds in an appropriate and healthy way. People had really good experiences learning how to deal with the complexities of the real world. Because you see, these things are all connected. They're all connected. It's like we need a, a space that we can open up into a liminal space so that as we're trying to grapple with these questions, we actually relax our gaze to see the whole gestalt. And so Nora was helping us to do that. And all the, way, all the while, just so you know, because there are all these virtual online activities, there were actually farm visits and things going on. These are some activities up in the Caledon area. Uh, where on Wednesday they had gatherings. Susan Graham hosted people. People have been going up to Hartwood Farm. If you haven't tried it yet, there will be Hartwood Cider in the refreshment area. They make good cider. These are cool people. Montville Farm is up there nearby. There are a bunch of friends. This is one of those places where you go and visit and you're at risk of moving there. Um, so this was happening in parallel, that people were actually weaving each other on the ground into their landscapes while getting a break from the internet, getting awake from the, uh, a break from their screens. So this was something that was happening in parallel on Wednesday, but was connected to the summit. And then we get to Thursday. Oh my God, Thursday. For those of you who didn't see it, go back and watch the recordings. It was incredible. Because what we did, we set our goal that we would live in the world of the eagle and the condor for a day that we would practice finding the third way, finding the world beyond the world of the indigenous and the world of the modern settlers and the world that we all have to get to. And interestingly, I chose this picture here because it includes the Quetzal, because the Quetzal is the spirit animal of Mesoamerica, which isn't normally included in the story. But actually, we talked a lot about these exchanges across cultures, across the continents, across millennia that have been happening, and they've been forgotten. And so Dan and I co-hosted this. I would say, um, I told Dan he was Batman and I was Robin, sort of how it worked. Because Dan Longboat uh, is uh, really holding the space among his peers in the indigenous world in a way that's really quite beautiful. And so we invited this. I played the very important role of bridging to the other culture. If it was only indigenous people speaking to themselves, we're not in the third way, are we? We're not in the eagle and the condor. We're not in the new world. So I was like a representation of that in this conversation. And we started off the morning by exploring Turtle Island. What would it take to regenerate the continent? So we had Jason Baldis talk about the Buffalo Nation Trust and the work they're doing in Wyoming, where they're restoring the land of the wild buffalo and they're restoring the culture and the heritage of their children as they're learning about it. And it was pretty amazing what these guys are doing. It was amazing. The way they've been mapping the land and raising millions of dollars and buying land and connecting like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle to put the pieces back together for the massive range of buffalo that needs to be restored and the massive rift in their culture as the buffalo had been destroyed and as they were sent to boarding schools or to early graves, these stories we all know so well. And he talked about this. And he was very proud in the positive sense of just, my people know how to live in this place and we've lived here for thousands of years and we also know how to restore it. And you can feel it. The Buffalo people are organizing. And then we connected this to the teachings of the people here. This is Henry Lickers, who is telling us about the ways of the Haudenosaunee on the Anishinaabe and the people of this region, and how you don't begin any conversation without this. And actually, Dan started and ended the day, the words that, become, that come before all else. And he showed how there are protocols that their culture practices in every single conversation to be sure that every conversation is contained 
and a connection to the rest of life. And that they've practiced and lived this way, as they would say, since time immemorial. As they would say, from the beginning of time. What they mean by this is that you only exist because of all of these things. You wouldn't even be here to have a conversation without them. So you need to remember that and express your gratitude and express your responsibility. And we explored what this meant. And we explored how we have to return to it. And as we were doing this, it let us start to see what the relationships might become. And then we invited these two lovely ladies. I've forgotten their name at the moment, but they were, I've met a lot of people this week. I've forgotten their names, but they're from Trent University, and they're leading this project with a couple of the other members of their, of their program to create a Great Lakes network of indigenous leaders around the fisheries. And they're making progress and weaving together these communities. And you can feel the potential. What does it mean for a whole bunch of different indigenous groups spread across the same landscape system, the Great Lakes Basin? What would it mean for them to create an indigenous knowledge commons and have sovereignty over it and have the capacity to teach it to their own people? and also to teach it to the outsiders who need to learn so that they can regenerate their landscapes. And we were talking now not just about the Buffalo people, but we were talking about the Great Lakes. Put the Great Plains and the Great Lakes together, you've covered quite a bit of North America, haven't you? We're feeling into what would it mean to weave at the scale of a continent. And then we brought in some of the wisdom and the guidance of Orrin Lyons and talking about the traditions of this region, and the way that they built their peace, the peace that they had when the foreigners came. And we kept going back to history and feeling the significance of the history, the continuity of the people. It was, you know, the Dutch come and go, then the French come and go, then the British come and go. You think Canada's going to stay? You think the United States is going to stay? Nation states are already a relic. They're already poorly suited to the task of the challenges in our world today. What will come after them? By the way, more than 90% of nation states in the world are less than 100 years old. Most of them were created in the 20th century. They're not permanent, and they don't even work very well. Whereas these guys, they figured something out. It lasted a long time, and it's still here. Yeah, how lucky you are to have intact indigenous cultures where you live. It's amazing. I'm from the US. Most of them got sent to reservations really far away. No connection to their ancestral lands. This is amazing, the capacity of these people. And so we were talking about, how do we find this third way? How do we bring the best of traditional knowledge together with the best of science and technology and modern contemporary knowledge? How do we do that? And then we brought in Larry McDermott, so just so you know, Larry and Henry are both people who work at really large scales. Henry was on the International Joint Commission for the Great Lakes. Larry works on the coordination of large ecosystem restoration and conservation projects at global scales. These are like world-class environmental scientists, as well as indigenous leaders. And when they came to talk to us, they were talking about the organizing of people and the organizing of knowledge for what it would take to do things like restore the health of the Great Lakes, because the Great Lakes are not healthy. And so we were having this conversation where you couldn't really tell. You know, when Larry's talking, he's talking like a scientist. Is he indigenous or is he Western? The answer is it doesn't matter. What matters is we have coherent knowledge systems relevant to the challenges we're facing. We have relevant ethical frameworks relative to the challenges we're facing. And they are the embodiment of the third way already. And all of us who are working to regenerate the landscapes and the living systems around us, we're already in the third way. We're already weaving the ethics of care for life together with service to life and the responsibility that that brings simply by caring and acting on it. And this was a major theme throughout the day. And then we had Nick McLeary come up and talk about the sacred fires. 
we had this really interesting moment when we were talking about the seventh fire. I don't know these prophecies very well, so I'll mess them up in their details. But I know the seventh fire is the time of people awakening that the world as it is has no future. In Greek language, we'd call it the time of the apocalypse, the time when the veil becomes clear, thin and you can see the consequences of your actions. Your consequences come home to roost. In the Ashinawe um, tradition, this is the seventh fire. And when you get to the eighth fire, that is the time of decision. Sandra, way back on day one, said when you get to the eighth fire, where you have to choose between the charred path of death and ruin or the green path of life and flourishing. And it's a choice, because if you continue the way you're going, you're defaulting into death. What she said was, when you get to that point, your work is to go back and gather all of the stories and all of the memories and all of the knowledge from before that you're going to need for the journey ahead. So we were talking about this, and we were talking about how the eighth fire, the time when humanity will choose whether or not we go extinct, that that time is coming soon. And the time of the seventh fire is the time of preparation, the time where we prepare for the decision that is coming. And a big insight that we gained on this day, a big insight, was that none of us are ready. Our indigenous friends who have so much knowledge to share, like Nick said, in his community, they don't even have drinking water coming out of their taps. They're some of the poorest people in your bioregion, some of the most oppressed and put on the sides. Do you think that they're ready for hundreds of thousands of people coming to them to ask how to restore water or how to care for trees or how to talk to the lake? No, they're not prepared. Their communities are in tatters. And so part of the work of preparing for the eighth fire is bringing the resources and the capacities to indigenous people to serve their own communities, to build their own capacities to govern themselves so that they are available to help those who need them from outside of their communities. Those who are not in indigenous cultures have work to do too, and it's the work we're doing in this summit trauma healing, organizing our landscapes, creating those financial flows that support the tapestries of projects so governance acts in service to the life of our landscapes. That is the work of preparation for the eighth fire. I didn't know that until Thursday afternoon. I found a different way of understanding my own work. So powerful what happened on Thursday afternoon. And then we had Dan telling us stories about those treaties including the little section that, that Brian showed you at the beginning. And he, like he said, all the principles are there. All of the principles written into this belt are there. They tell us we are inextricably bound to each other in our future survival. The ancestral peoples and the ones who came here, they're all going to die. We are all going to die if we don't learn how to act in service to life. Period. They call it natural law because it's just how nature works. And so we took this very seriously. And so when we got to Friday morning, where we were talking about how do we listen to the land, and Penny and I told the story of our time traveling through the Colorado River from the headwaters to the Sea of Cortez, there are pictures of us gathering water from the headwaters that we're going to bring to the Sea of Cortez as gifts. We talked about the work in Barichara and why the rivers have gone away and why we have to listen to the land to heal it. We had our friend Rita Marsh tell the story of the Crystal River and the headwaters of the Colorado, the Crystal Rivers in Carbondale, Colorado, and the western slopes, and how when she went there with an animal communicator, they could listen to the stories of the land from the animals. And Rita expected animals from that place. It's like, I'm in the Rocky Mountains. I expect to hear from the bears and the elk, maybe the beavers. You know who she heard? The dolphins and the whales in the Sea of Cortez, saying, please bring us our water. Because since 1967, the Colorado River no longer goes to the Sea of Cortez. 
Glen Canyon Dam holds all that water back to be sure that Phoenix, Tucson, Las Vegas, Los Angeles, San Diego, that they get to grow unsustainably large human populations while ensuring no water gets to the people in Mexico. That is a system of death. And so we were talking about birthing a system of life to regenerate the Colorado. How do you talk to? How do you listen to land? That's what we explored yesterday in the morning. But then we went right back to weaving. Brian came in. He has a nice smile. <laughs> Brian came in and said, well, how do we listen to the land in the greater Toronto bioregion? Well, you might start by listening to the Oak Ridge's moraine, kind of important, birthplace of 65 rivers, the beautiful giant sponge that takes in all the water and brings life across this massive landscape. Like, well, what if we practice listening to that? So then we did, we listened to it with all of them. See, it turns out there's a huge amount of stuff that's already happening here. Great, fantastic work. It's just not organized at the bioregional scale. We had John Stiles up there from the Toronto Regional Conservation Authority telling us that they have thousands of field-ready ecosystem restoration projects. And they do about 300 ecosystem restoration projects per year. It's kind of amazing. You know, they're like the the beautiful giant conservation authority of, of Ontario and make all the other conservation authorities a little jealous because they're like so big and so capable. But they've created this database system and these priority schemes so that you can track all the ecosystem restoration projects and then decide where the funding goes. Doesn't that sound like a collaborative funding ecosystem that already exists in the urban core of Toronto? Not exactly a sustainable beacon, is it? You wouldn't think of that downtown urban core as where the sustainability work is, but that's where they've organized that system. And then you had Janet McKay from LEAF talking about how to help people turn their backyards into forest with native trees. You had Saba Ahmed from the Niagara Escarpment Biosphere Conservancy talking about the land trusts and the conservation areas organized along the Niagara Escarpment. You had Catherine Thomas, was it Karen Thomas? My brain's getting jumbled. It was come, coming in from Trent University talking about the status of our soils and the quality of our farmland and the ways that we can organize around food shed security. And then we had Susan Walmer from the Oak Ridges Moraine Land Trust talking about how they're organizing conservation areas and ecological corridors for the protection and the restoration of the Oak Ridges Moraine. And you're like, huh, that sure sounds like bioregional regeneration, doesn't it? It sure does. Part of listening to the land is hearing the people who are already doing the work. And importantly, having them hear each other to know that they're already part of a larger story. They just didn't know it yet. And the story is coming to life. The story of a bioregional earth is coming to life. And then yesterday, we had Jonathan Rosen. He and I had a great chat. Like, let's explore the metacrisis. We have so many crises all at once, and part of the crisis is how I respond to crisis, which means I can't make sense of the crisis. <gasps> Does that sound familiar? Mm -hmm. It should. So he talked about these different ways of understanding crisis. It's like philosophical details that are hugely important. And we said, what does it take? How do we create unprecedented collaboration? Collaboration to regenerate the entire planet. How do we do that? We need good philosophy for that. We need good concepts. We need really good clarity. We need really good strategy. And so we explored that as, again, another space to relax and go deeper and feel the significance of what we're doing. We need new philosophies, not just the old ones from our indigenous brothers and sisters. We need new ones like the difference between polycrisis, permacrisis, and metacrisis, which Jonathan figured out in the last few months. It's new philosophy. Just like sometimes you need new mathematics to understand the patterns you're dealing with. We're entering a new world. And then we started practicing the third way. We brought in Jay Bowen from the Skagit Nation in the Salish Sea. We were feeling into how do we explore this together. And we can feel that it's going to be hard. There's going to be a lot of work to do. That we're carrying our traumas, that our relationships are not already healthy. That we got to figure this out together. 
and it's the wounded healers doing the healing. So we explored that a bit in the afternoon. And then you come back to this image and you see what we did. You see what we did. We've been weaving these relationships for decades so that we can bring them into a coherent pattern and show you how the pattern works so you can see it. You can experience it and you can see it and go, oh, that's what we did. We have to do more of that. That weaving pattern, that thing that happened in these last six days, we have to do that. And that's how we live into these regenerative stories. And so you can see in the way that I put this presentation together, I wanted to give us a review and a summary of the summit, but I wanted to do something deeper. I wanted you to see how to do it. Because we need more of us doing this. And so you can already feel like, oh, OK, so what, what's next? The weaving's not going to end, is it? Well, we're going to come back to that. If you're going to come back to that, let's take a moment and just let this sink in. Like, what has happened in these last six, last six days that no one can see all of? I painted this sketch as though I saw all of it. I didn't. I'm showing you the parts I saw, because I was central to the facilitation of it. So I saw a lot. But there's a huge amount that I didn't see. There's a huge amount of weaving of people and ideas and actions that I did not see. It's way bigger than what I showed you. But I would just wanted you to see how it works. Because this is the work of the weavers of bioregions. Now, you don't have to all be weavers of bioregions, but you need to understand how it works. So that when someone is helping to weave you where you need to go, you know how to respond. It's like knowing how to do a line dance. If you've ever done line dancing, or country dancing, or square dancing, where you actually have to know the pattern of the movement to know your part so you can participate in the dance. Wherever you are in this weave, you need to know that you are a weaver who is weaving and who is being woven. And you're all three. You're all three. You can weave the relationships. You can be woven into the relationships. And you can also be the weave, the tapestry itself. And so that's what we did in the last six days. And that's what we're going to continue doing with greater skill, having practiced doing it and creating this summit. I really take seriously what Jay Bowen said yesterday, if you heard. He said he feels we're some of the most important people on the planet right now. And uh, I believe that's true. I believe that we are, we are the bridge from the seventh fire to the lighting of the eighth fire, all of us here in this room and online. So I just really wanted to thank you all for being here. So there's a lot I could reflect upon. Um, from this week, obviously, from Joe's presentation. Um, but there's a, three themes that sort of arose for me as I've been pondering last night and this morning what to reflect upon with you today. And uh, the first of those themes has to do with complexity and embracing complexity. So Nora Bateson came to us on Wednesday she talked about complexity, and she talked about double binds. And there's a, bind, a double bind that I've been feeling this week coming up for me pretty strongly, which is that on the one hand, we need to slow down and come into relationship and, and heal together. We, and that takes time to unfold, time to unfold to come into these relationships, to come into right relationship and to heal in the way that we need to. And then on the other hand, there's this urgency because we're in the metacrisis and we have to act now. And, you know, Jay Bowen, he, he also mentioned, he says he thinks we have between 1,200 and 1,500 days before we don't have a choice because we're going to be in the midst of the collapse, uh, the, the collapse, and we'll be in survival mode. And so, so I don't know if that's accurate, but I think the sentiment is right, that, we, that there is this urgency. So we have both of these things, this double bind. And um, what Nora said about double binds is she said, we need to think 
trans contextually, so across contexts, to be able to to address double binds. So that's the second theme that 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 is really arising for me is that we need to be thinking system when we're when whatever we do now we have to do it systemically and across contexts, building designing in multiple contexts into whatever we're doing. So for instance, with this double bind I just mentioned, we have to design into whatever we're doing the building of relationships, the, the healing processes, and across multiple contexts, no matter what we're doing, into the same processes. So if you think of <clears throat> like a bioregional learning center, so how do we heal together? How do we come into relationship together? In, how do we learn together? How do we think about value flows together? All these different contexts in one system that we're designing. Um, we had some really good examples of this on Wednesday, um, already in practice, from what Joe mentioned, Justine, um, with our, our food future, and with Vicki Saunders. So, you, you saw from what they were saying that the core of what they were doing was building relationship. They were building the relationship across the context, across the multi-stakeholder networks. Vicky was saying, bringing these women together, the core of it is they're supporting each other, the, the relational field, the support of each other. So, so I think we have really, really good examples in Bodhichara as well. Uh, of how to do this, that we can, this is how we need to be designing. And then the third theme for me that came up that is, it's more personal for me, um, which is this notion or this ethic of sacred responsibility that keeps coming up throughout this summit, especially from the indigenous brothers and sisters. Um, there was a certain presence that that I felt in the room on Thursday from, from the indigenous people because they hold this responsibility sacred. And so I've been feeling into that in myself. Like, what, what, what does it mean for me to really hold that responsibility to, to show up fully, to do things that are uncomfortable, but I'm going to do it anyway because this is the time we have to do this. And it's our responsibility to be in service to life. So that's, um, for me personally, that's something I'm really working with and, and taking really seriously. The Honorable David Crombie, former mayor of Toronto and federal cabinet minister, opened our summit on Monday. And what st stuck in my mind was um, he took a study of Toronto's waterfront. He uh, talked to people all over the region and he decided to expand the mandate of his study. And he was one of the first, maybe the first, to define the greater Toronto bioregion. And that was groundbreaking in 1992. And it's in his regeneration report from the time. And he laid the groundwork for some really important things coming after that. Protection of the Oak Ridges Moraine, creation of the Green Belt. It really was visionary and groundbreaking. And he, and he said, I did it because everything is connected to everything else. What happens at the headwaters of the river, what happens as the river comes down, affects the waterfront. The, the ecosystems, the ecology, the, the way you do urban development, it's all connected. At the Legacy Table discussion on Monday, Susan talked about what's real, what's real. And she boils it down to two things, the people in your life that you can touch, you can hold out your hand to, and the land that you're standing on. Everything else is a story. So how do we change the story? How do we live a better story in service to life? Sandra LaRonde talked about growing up in her indigenous community in Northern Ontario. I'm from Northern Ontario. I really related to her description of the land and the water and the, these great mounds of rock from the Canadian Shield that poke out of the landscape. She talked about that we need to live within natural law 
and be in right relationship with ourselves, with each other, and with the land. In terms of bioregional learning, Sandra talked about if you want to learn about your place, you need to start by learning the indigenous stories that arose out of that place for thousands of years. On Wednesday, as, as Penny mentioned, Nora Bateson talked about double binds being pervasive in the poly crisis, and that a problem-solution approach often makes it worse. That's really hard to hear, uh, for an engineer to hear, problem-solution often makes it worse. But we've become such a, a, a focused society on breaking things down into bits and trying to solve the bits that we make the bigger complexity of the challenges we're facing worse. So she talked about the fact that you need to add context to whatever you're looking at. Add context, go bigger, um, and to meet, not match, the complexity. On Thursday, what, uh, one of the things that stuck in my mind was Larry McDermott talked about the need to bring the empathetic, spiritual component to the work. He also talked about indigenous knowledge systems are knowledge systems of abundance, which is very different from the Western culture I was brought up in. And he told us to resist the impulse for quick action. Again, really hard for an engineer to hear. <laughs> Want to get it done, want to get it solved. Uh, but he said, slow down, it's about building the relationships first. Uh, Friday, we learned about all the work that needs to be done to regenerate the, the GTB, the Greater Tuckeronto Bioregion. There's 13 conservation authorities within our current definition of the bioregion. Uh, the, the largest in terms of budget and, 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 and expertise is the Toronto Region Conservation Authority. Um, and uh, John Still talked about the fact they have mapped out, and they've got it all computerized, tens of thousands of restoration projects just within the TRCA boundaries. Tens of thousands. He said, we do maybe three, four, five hundred per year. Okay? There's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of resources that we collectively have to bring into that regeneration process. And we saw the need, we have all these great existing initiatives, uh, LEAF, the Backyard Tree Planning Program, uh, the Land Trusts, um, a lot of different things happening in terms of trying different ways of regenerative agriculture. But all of these things uh, can go, need to expand, they need to go deeper, and they need all of us involved, bringing our time and resources to it. And yesterday, uh, Jonathan Rowson and Joe talked about the need to build parallel structures within and beside existing systems. And uh, as Joe said, Jonathan also talked to, to us about the metacrisis, that he prefers that term over polycrisis or permacrisis. He likes metacrisis because it helps us to go beyond a crisis mentality. Meta is a rich term going within ourselves, going between, going after, going beyond. The whole week, one of the things that has been really rattling around my head as we've been you know, fighting fires and trying to make sure everything fell into place is that stories is all we are. And that was, I mean, the major theme of the summit was the unfolding of a story. What stories are we telling each other? What stories are we telling ourselves? And several, Joe has mentioned it, and Brian mentioned Sandra Laurent speaking with us around the legacy table on Monday. And she looked at me, I was sitting here, she was sitting over here, and she looked at me and she said, can we just start with the indigenous stories? Can we start there? Because I think there's so much richness and possibility in those stories. And she talked about indigenous stories being porous, that in Western European stories, we often have a moral of the story, a lesson that we're supposed to take away. And in indigenous stories, it's more porous. 
You might take something away one day and something else another day. You might take something away from one story told by one storyteller and then the same story told by another storyteller, you'll take something else away. There's this wonderful richness. It's like water, trying to hold water in your hand, right? Those are the kinds of stories that we really need. And I think about Rex Lyons talking about the fact that a Western European world is a straight line. And what we need is the indigenous world of the circle. That we get stuck if we think everything is going to move smoothly in a straight line. And that these circles can find can give us comfort and power, even the intergenerational circle. When we connect young and old, we are completing the circle. And there is comfort and insight and power in completing that circle. And then I think about Oren Lyons and him talking about the instructions that are inherent in indigenous cultures, that are in, are in intact healthy indigenous cultures. And indigenous cultures are struggling because they've lost a lot of those instructions. They need those instructions to bring their culture and the health of their communities back, but we need those instructions too. She, he said there are eight billion people in this world. Who's giving all those people instructions? Where are we supposed to find our instructions? This is a big question. Then we looked at uniqueness of place, and I found it really interesting to compare Cascadia to the GTB. Even something like, OK, what are the risks that we're facing? We know the big one could hit the West Coast. Here, I was surprised to learn microburst storms. Who knew that all of a sudden, in a very concentrated area, you could get way more water than you thought? And it's very difficult to predict the microburst storms. So the risks in the different places. And if we are living in this place, we need to understand what's special, what's important, what's unique, and what the risks are in our place if we are going to move forward in an uncertain world. Then we talked on Tuesday, and Joe said something he had never said before. It was the first time I heard him say that a bioregion is your life place. It's your life place. It is the place where you live your life, and that is the place that gives you life. If you think about it in that kind of relationship sense, I mean, there's power there. This idea of a bioregion and then the nested fractal scale linking is a real way to bring coherence to our thinking. Then I watched the interaction between Debbie and Kieran, and that was great. I mean, I've worked in intergenerational for a lot of years, and you guys just warmed my heart. And, and to see that Kieran is still searching and trying to figure it out. And I know that there are other students here that are in the same kind of place. But what was also impressive to me was Debbie, after 30 years of really hard slogging to protect the Oak Ridge's moraine, suddenly said she came to the epiphany that it's not enough and that she needs to change, that we need, and it's, it's not that the story that she was working on was a bad story, it's that now we're on to the next chapter. We gotta do the next chapter. That's really big. That's a big moment for someone, and for our bioregion, because she's the kind of people that bring this place alive, and that we really need. Then we had Nora Bateson. And people were a little confused, like, OK, what, is this connected or not? And for me, here's the thing. For ecology, we talk about the fundamental part of the bioregion is we need healthy soil. We need to make our soils healthy again. What Nora is doing is working in the psychological soil. She's trying to figure out ways of, in this world where 
in Oren Lyon's words, we don't have instructions. How do we make sense of everything and understand the complexity and deal with all of that? And we've been using Nora as kind of a thread throughout the week, pulling on her book, Combining. And I just wanted to read two really short sections that when I was flipping through the book this morning, they just kind of jumped out at me like, this is what you re need to read to finish up the summit. And the first is from her book, and it's a, it's a piece called In the Fire. And I thought of the seventh fire, and I thought of what we had talked about on Thursday with the Indigenous focus. And she writes, every behavior makes sense within particular contexts. Be careful what contexts get created. But now that we are in the fire, Responding to the context and not polarizing with the behavior is enormously challenging. The horizon is all questions, play, and tenderness. And some rage and some tears. This is a diffused process. And then another piece that called out to me that needed to be read in this moment is a piece called Somehow. Somehow we have to carry trauma and stay imaginative enough to rebuild a society that cares. Somehow we have to be angry enough to fight and tender enough to stay sensitive to the nuances of mutual learning. Somehow from the fragmentation of human constructs we have to find a way to perceive and participate in the unity of life. Somehow, we have to. What I want to do now is start to share with you a bit of how we dream of a bioregional Earth. And you'll see that dreams, when they start, they start from an impulse something that's not resolved, something that needs to be completed, something that needs to be expressed, something that hasn't yet happened. We're in a place like that right now. We're in a pregnant place, a place where something, something beautiful, something pure, something innocent needs to be born. But how can we do that when there's been so much pain and so much conflict and so much destruction? We have to remember how to dream. What I want to share with you is just very simply how we see bioregional Earth being born, how we see it happening. Because something I learned a long time ago is that all of the things we need to do, they've been known. You can find them. They're in books. They're in videos. They're in people's backyard projects. They're all over. So why is it that we're not doing this? At what point did we lose the collective ability to dream? We're dreaming of birthing a bioregional Earth, an Earth in which humanity becomes reintegrated completely with the harmony of life as part of the planet, something that we have largely failed to do in recent millennia. And so, the idea I want to lay out for you is schematic. It's simple. Hopefully it's even elegant. It's not meant to be embellished with detail. The de detail will be embellished by the actions of those who live into this dream. And so I see this dream starting with a line. As we pass forward in time, what do we need to do? Remember, we already talked about how to organize ourselves and some of the systems we need to build. We need to build these systems. We need to create these frameworks of collaboration. We need to connect the dots, put the pieces together, manifest these things in the world. We're already doing this very actively in three bioregions, three parts of the planet right now here in the greater Takaranto bioregion. Much of the groundwork has been laid to see what are the pieces 
that can be brought together and the weaving has begun. And they don't yet exist and there's more work to do. Penny and I have been helping to catalyze the process with our friends in Cascadia and they are organizing and convening and gathering and structuring the processes for people to organize around the watersheds. Cascadia has 435 watersheds. And then in the Northern Andes, with our work in Barichara, and currently with five other territories, each of which is setting up a territorial foundation. And we're starting to create learning exchanges across them, from all the way up north by Santa Marta and the Caribbean coast, all the way down to Putumayo, which is one of the headwaters of the Amazon River that's born in the Paramos, the special high mountain marshlands of southern Colombia. We've already started manifesting these structures and these patterns into these landscapes, but we're just getting started. We're also helping to catalyze this into other bioregions. We're starting to create contexts of shared language, shared concepts, shared approaches to be able to communicate with each other, to be able to work together so that we can spread this across many different bioregions. This way of organizing ourselves appropriate to each place. And as we do this, this is the work of preparing for the eighth fire. Because you see, we cannot choose the green path. We cannot choose the path into flourishing of the living systems of the earth unless we know how to do it collectively. And this is how we will learn how. By organizing our landscapes and our communities into processes of bioregional regeneration. And in doing this, we can actually choose the green path. In a way, it's very simple. Do we organize ourselves to be in service to life at the scale of our living systems, or do we not? But actually doing it has remained a mystery for many people. How do we organize ourselves? What does it look like? How do we begin? So the manifestation of this dream is that people, wherever they are on Earth, start to organize their landscapes. And as they organize their landscapes, they bring in the elements that they know that they'll need. We have to learn together, and we have to have collective understanding of our place. We have to see what is already here and work with it to bring it into greater harmony between the pieces at a holistic scale of the landscape as a whole. And we have to coordinate all of the flows and resources and decisions in service to that collective well-being. But in order to do that, we have to collaborate with other landscapes. We have to learn from and with each other. Those of us who are further along need to help those who are less far along. Why? Because those who are less far along will very soon come after you with machetes or pickaxes when they're starving. The only way our bioregions can do this is if the other bioregions do it too. It's an all or nothing. This is an all or nothing. And see, it's sort of simple to draw because the idea is know how to organize your landscape, start practicing in key landscapes to really demonstrate how it works, spread the knowledge and practices while continually learning from each other because the others will surely have things to teach and create a network of them across the world. And that's it. Simple, right? I would call this 200 to 500 years of work. This is the dream of a bioregional Earth. We want to get to a place where humans are part of the whole life context of that place, and that is what a bioregion is. What we're talking about is coming home. We're talking about coming home. Coming home is going to the place that you are from. It's going to the place that made you who you are. It's going to the place that made it possible for you to exist. And it's going to the place where you are nourished with everything that you need. And so when we're talking about birthing the dream, 
notice how it addresses the core issue of our environmental problems without solving a problem. Climate change is not a problem. It's a symptom of ecological overshoot. Pollution is not a problem. It's a symptom of incomplete cycling of materials. It's about relationships. And the core question for us is what is the relationship for humans with the rest of life? That is the question that we need to answer. Where do we go from here? Knowing that the story is not yet written, but we know the narrative arc. We know the arc of the story. We know the direction that it goes. We know more or less the shape of it. What we need to know is what is the next step that I take? What is the responsibility I have? What is the part I can play? Because what's been missing from so many of our stories is the protagonist. Because we're usually looking for someone else to solve our problems for us. What this story really tells us deep in its core is that it's not just we're each responsible, it's that we're each empowered. We're empowered. We are capable. A theme that we heard throughout the week with our indigenous friends was that they were told, you're supposed to care for all life. Henry Licker said it. He was like 12 years old. His grandma said, you have to care for all life. And he's like, that sounds hard. And his grandma said, yeah, but you can do it. <laughs> we have to know it's hard and know we can do it. And we can. And so with that in mind, um, what we want to do is invite you into the expression of this dream, how the dream becomes a collective dream, is that we start to feel it in ourselves. We start to express it together. I'm Joe Brewer. And I'm Penny Heifel. And we are in the ancestral lands of the Guane people in the northern Andes of Colombia. In the town of Barichara. And, and we stand, stand up, up for bioregional Bio earth. earth. Hello, my name is Maria Elena Danes. My name is Carson Cristiani. And we are in the Tame Garonne in the south of France. And we, we stand, stand up, up for, for bioregional Bio Earth. Earth. This is Richard Coates living in the River Thames watershed. And I stand up for bioregional Earth. My name is Rita Marsh. I live in the former homeland of Nooch in the Roaring Fork River watershed, Carbondale, Colorado, USA. I stand for bioregional earth. Hi, I'm Shannon Wells. I live on the lands of the Coast Salish people in the Cascadia bioregion in a place that is today called Seattle. I'm in love with this place, and so I stand up for bioregional earth. My name is Claire Atwell. I live in Victoria, BC, on the unceded lands of the Lekwungen and Wasonic speaking people, and I stand up for bioregional Earth. Hello, I'm Diana Bryant, and I am in Kansas City, Missouri, in the United States, in the watershed of the Missouri River that you see behind me, and I stand up for bioregional Earth. Hi, my name is Jillian Williams. I'm from Cleveland, Ohio, and I stand with Bioregional Earth. Maria Zazbukova. I live in Cajica in the Savannah de Bogota region in Colombia, and I stand up for Bioregional Earth. Hi, my name is Elias. I'm calling from a little town called Cheba in the southern border of the Mediterranean Sea, and I stand up for Bioregional Earth. Hi, I'm Victoria Zellin. And I'm Jonathan Cloud. And we live in the unceded territory of the Haudenosaunee. In the Genesee Finger Lakes bioregion of the Great Lakes. And, and we, we stand, stand up, up for bioregional Bio Earth. Hello, my name is Karim, currently living in the mountains above Beirut in Lebanon, serving the East Mediterranean bioregion. And I stand for bioregional Earth. Hi, my name is Lina. 
and I live in uh, Korsør in Denmark, which is the northern part of Europe. And I live on the west coast of uh, an island called Sealand. And I stand up for bioregional Earth. Hi, I'm Kieran Topiwala. Hi, I'm Lamia Sharma. Hi, I'm Rajan Topiwala. Hi, I'm Nikita Nair, and we're all part of the Kula team. And we are currently here in uh, Cubbon Park, Bangalore. And we stand for bioregional Earth. Woo! <laughs> Open your mind to discover 